alcohol protecting groups are a pretty big deal in organic chemistry. Well, many topics are important. Why should you care about protecting groups specifically? Well, alcohol functional group is a very versatile in terms of its reactivity and chemical transformations that it can participate in. And precisely this high chemical reactivity is often a problem when we are trying to perform some sort of chemistry and an alcohol functional group just interferes with that. For instance, if I try to do a Grignier reaction with this molecule, I would face a problem. And the problem here is that the Grignier reagent, phenyl magnesium bromide in this case, is not only an excellent nucleophile, but it is also a strong base. So instead of attacking my carbonyl, we are going to do the acid base chemistry here, snatching this proton instead, which going to lead to the formation of the alkoxide. And once we do our acid workup, we are going to end up with our original molecule and not the intended product. Well, you might argue that that's not that big of a deal. We'll just use two equivalents of our Grignard reagent and get what we want at the end. And you would be correct in this particular case. We can certainly do that here. But that's only possible because the Grignard reagent that we are using in this particular reaction is dirt cheap and easy to make. This approach would be a horrible waste of time and material if, say, instead of something simple like phenyl magnesium bromide, I use the complex reagent that I spend days or maybe even weeks making. This is where protecting groups come into play. You see, instead of using two equivalents of our Grignier reagent, we can use a temporary protecting group that we can put onto our alcohol. This way, alcohol won't be able to mess up our reaction. And once we're done, we can take that protecting reagent off and get our original functional group via the deprotection step. There are three common types of protecting groups that we use for alcohols. That's going to be the silyl protection, the benzyl protection, and the acetyl protecting groups. Each of these protecting groups has its strengths and weaknesses. And the most universal of all of those three is going to be the silyl protection group. So let's talk about that one first. When it comes to silyl ether protecting groups, the most two common silyl ethers that you are going to be using is either going to be trimethyl silyl ether or TMS for short, or we're going to be using third butyl dimethyl silyl ether, which we're going to abbreviate as TBDMS. We use the second one, this guy, uh, when we want to turn our alcohol into a more bulky group for finer steric control of our reaction. This one also seems to be a little bit more resilient to various reaction conditions. For our purposes, however, these are interchangeable. So I'm going to be using the TMS as an example structure here for all of my reactions. And the first question that I have is how are we going Going to apply our protecting group onto our molecule. In the case of the silanes, we are going to use the corresponding chloride. So if I wanted to add TMS to my molecule, I would use the corresponding trimethylsilane chloride in pyridine or triethylamine as a solvent. The mechanism here is fairly straightforward. This is going to be an SN2 style reaction where first alcohol is going to displace the chlorine out of my silane, giving me a protonated intermediate and then we are going to be using one of our bases, either a triethylamine or maybe pyridine, which we typically can use as our solvent, to deprotonate that molecule and give us a neutral product. We can spell out our trimethylsilyl group as such, or if we are pressed for time, or maybe you just like abbreviations, you can abbreviate that as TMS. The big limitation of this protecting group is in the case when you have multiple potential nucleophilic sites. In this case, you can potentially find yourself in a situation where you have silicon sitting on multiple places in your molecule. So when you are planning your synthesis, it is always a good idea to introduce your protecting group at an appropriate point where it is not going to jump on multiple atoms just making a mess. It's hardly going to be an issue with simple molecules, of course, but it can certainly muddle the waters in more complex substrates. And so now, when I have my alcohol protected, I can easily do my reaction and not worry about alcohol messing things up. Alright, cool. 
So we've done our chemistry here, everything worked the way we anticipated, now what? We still have this protecting group, this TMS, sitting on our molecule, so we need to get rid of it somehow. And as I've mentioned before, silyl protection is incredibly resilient to a lot of different conditions. This means that it's going to be stay put in both acidic and basic conditions. So does it mean that we're stuck with it forever? Well, certainly not. While the silyl protecting group might be very resilient, it does have one major weakness, and this weakness is the fluoride ion. If we treat our product with anything containing fluoride, it will react with silicon and displace it via a simple SN2 style reaction. The easiest source of a fluoride is of course going to be hydrofluoric acid, HF. However, since the glassware that we use in the lab is silicon based, HF tends to dissolve the glass just as easily as taking the silyl ethers off our molecule. So unless you have platinum beakers in your lab, and yes, they do exist, you are out of luck and need some other source of fluoride. Ionic fluorides, like let's say something like, I don't know, potassium fluoride or something similar, have one major problem. They do not dissolve an organic solvent. So we need to do something more creative to kill both birds in the same stone. Bring fluoride to our molecule and have it in an organic solvable form. And the solution here is quite elegant. To make our ionic fluoride solvable in organic solvents, we are going to use organic cations as our counter ions. The two most common ones are going to be tetraethyl ammonium fluoride or TIF, and another one is going to be tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride or TBAF. These reagents are quite soluble in organic solvents and they will drag the fluoride ion with them into our solution, delivering it to where it needs to be and where it needs to act upon our molecule. Now, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, silyl protection is one of the three main protecting groups that we typically see for alcohols. The next method that we we're going to see sometimes is the use of acetals. Typically, we're going to see either a dihydropyran, DHP, or methoxymethyl or MAM protecting groups in this segment. We add DHP group onto the alcohol in acidic conditions. This is a typical electrophilic addition to an alkene reaction. In this case, the alkene is especially susceptible to this reaction due to the polarization from the oxygen atom. Once the protecting group is on, it is very resilient towards the basic conditions. However, it is sensitive to acids like any other acetal, and it will easily pop off in acidic conditions. This is especially convenient since we can often combine the uh, deprotection step and the workup after reactions like, let's say, a Grignard reaction. So in this case, I can accomplish both in a single synthetic procedure by uh, protonating everything that needs to be protonated and taking my protecting group off. So when it comes to methoxymethyl protecting group, that one is installed in a similar fashion to the silyl protecting groups, basic conditions via the SN2 reaction. And similar to the DHP, the MOM is going to be sensitive towards acid and will easily pop off in acidic conditions. I also want to point out that if you opt to use one of these two protecting groups, you should probably go with DHP unless your substrate is really sensitive towards acids. The thing is, while MOM is an excellent protecting group, the reagent that we are using here, MOM chloride, well, that one is quite toxic and carcinogenic. So you should definitely avoid this MOM at all costs. And finally, we have the benzyl protecting group. This is an incredibly resilient protecting group, and we often see that when we are dealing with the glycochemistry, which is chemistry of carbohydrates. So most likely you are going to be using that as one of your major protecting groups if you cover sugars at the end of the second semester. Typically, we are going to install the benzyl protecting group via an SN2 reaction uh, of the corresponding alkoxide and benzyl halide. This is a typical Williamson ether synthesis, so there is nothing special about this reaction. However, you can also do it in milder conditions when the uh, SN2 reaction happens with an alcohol itself due to an extremely high reactivity of the benzyl chlorides. And just just like in the case with mom, benzyl chlorides and bromides are incredibly toxic and carcinogenic, so you should avoid those at all costs 
if you can, of course. What's really cool about this protecting group is that it's bulky and chemically resilient, so you are going to be more or less safe using it in both basic and acidic conditions. However, we can easily take it off by using hydrogen on palladium catalyst. Generally, we use this type of chemistry when we want to reduce a double or a triple bond, however, benzylic position, just like Albus Dumbledore, has its own privileges. And if you have a CO bond in the benzylic position, it can be broken by a simple reaction with hydrogen over heterogeneous catalyst. It turns this deprotection into the cleanest reaction out of all deprotections that we have seen so far. However, it comes with a huge disadvantage. Namely, if you have other double bonds in your molecule, you'll end up reducing them as well in addition to taking your protection off, which of course is not ideal, so you gotta be careful with this one. So, as you can see, there are options when it comes to alcohol protecting groups. Most likely, you're going to be using the Silyl protection as your main go-to protecting group for all alcohols. However, if you see the other ones, you'll know what they do and how to use them. As a general rule of thumb, you want to design your synthesis with the least number of steps possible, and using protection adds two steps to your overall scheme. One step to install the protecting group, and the other one to later remove it, which comes with a cost of time, money, and of course, most importantly, yield. But sometimes protecting groups are a necessary evil, so don't hesitate to use those if you really need to use one. Do you want to see more examples of the protecting groups in synthesis? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet, so you don't miss the video when I use one of those in a future video when I'm solving the synthesis problems. Thank you for watching, check out this video next, and I'll see you next time!